Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters, your Magic the Gathering source that helps you command your budget. This show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. If you're looking for an easy way to help support this show, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all their support. Hello and welcome to everyone's favorite, the infamous Golden Toilet Awards. The newest set in the precons that came along with it, Dungeons and Dragons Adventures in the Forgotten Realms have a lot of exciting commanders that have inspired commander players everywhere. And then there's the ones that are in this episode and are up for this award. Unfortunately for every commander in this episode, this is not the type of award that you actually want to win. These commanders might be bland or they're just uninspiring artists, plain don't like them. But the winner of this award will be receiving this incredible golden toilet. And the commander that wins this award will keep this trophy as well as the shame that comes along with it forever. Now, commanders can be considered for this award for a multitude of reasons, some of which I already have mentioned. But at the end of the day, every single commander that I've selected for this episode is based off of my own opinions. So the commanders that you would select for this award might be very different, and that's okay. And in fact, your very favorite commander from this set might win this award, and if that happens, well, I'm sorry in advance. Also, just to clarify, this is not a list of the weakest commanders from this set in Precon. This is simply a list of my least favorite, or in other words, my worst commanders from this set. There are a lot of reasons why you might not like a certain commander, and I will do my best to illustrate why I don't like these. But with all of that said, let's jump into it. Coming in at 10th place is the extremely disappointing and bland Gretchen Titch Willow. Gretchen is a 0-4 Halfling Druid for green and a blue, so it's a Simic Commander, and you might be guessing exactly what this Simic Commander does and why it's on this list before I'm even saying it. By paying 2 green-blue, you draw a card, you may put a land from your hand onto the battlefield. Wow, how incredibly original. A Simic Commander that deals with drawing cards and lands. How incredibly unexpected. <clears throat> yeah, no, this is absolute garbage. Please, wizard, stop printing Simic commanders that do the exact same thing. It's boring. And it's essentially a waste of a legendary creature in a set. I mean, why is this thing even legendary if no one's going to build around it? Because they already have better Simic commanders that do the exact same thing. This reminds me of yet another uncommon commander from the recent Strixhaven with Zimone Quadrix Prodigy, which again deals with lands and drawing cards. Or how about the original uncommon Simic Commander that deals with lands and drawing cards, Tatiova? Or the essentially Tatiova clone with AC Tyrant of Gyre Strait, which we got recently as well in Commander Legends. And I mean, we already have Thrasios, which essentially is the exact same thing, but better in so many ways. And I'm not saying that I want another broken partner commander like this one, I'm just saying I want some new things out of Simic. And while recently we have been getting some better Simic commanders that do some different things, we've also again been getting the same old, same old like Gretchen. So Gretchen, because you are bland, boring, and not at all unique, congratulations on 10th place. Next up, let's move on to 9th place with Icing Death Frost Tyrant. It's a 4-3 dragon with flying and vigilance for 2 white white. And when it dies, you create Icing Death Frost Tongue, a legendary white equipment artifact token with equipped creature gets plus 2 plus 0. Whenever equipped creature attacks, tap target creature defending player controls and equip 2. So actually, in a way, I find this commander to be kind of funny. You know, okay, if this commander dies, you get an equipment, which is basically its tongue. And then when you get your commander back in play, you can just equip its tongue to it. So it's kind of like running around with its tongue as a sword and like stabbing your opponents. So that is definitely pretty funny. But overall, this commander is just kind of meh. I think what really disappoints me with this commander is that though it is a unique concept, there's just a hefty limitation to it. 
That limitation being that the equipment that it makes is unfortunately legendary. So unfortunately, the only value that you get out of this commander is the first time when it dies, and pretty much not really at all after that. You know, unless, I guess, you sacrifice the artifact for some value in some way, or someone else destroys the artifact, etc, etc. But yeah, if they hadn't made that into a legendary equipment, it was just a regular piece of equipment, I think that'd be a pretty funny commander, just, you know, making your commander die a ton and suiting up with a lot of tongues that it's just kind of running around and, you know, winning with. But there are just plenty of other better equipment-based commanders that, well, actually would work really well in this kind of a deck if you do want to build around this one. So yeah, go ahead and include Danith the Capuchin, Balan Wandering Knight, and Halvar got a battle in this deck. And definitely make sure you include Ardent Intrepid Archaeologist, who can just, you know, move all of your auras and equipment onto target permanent you control. Two to equip your Frost Tongue is a decent amount, but again, this essentially negates that. Speaking of which, also Pure Steel Paladin can help out with that as well, having Metalcraft equipment you control have equipped zero for as long as you control three or more artifacts, and it also says whenever equipment enters the battlefield under control, you may draw a card, so yeah, a lot of value from this one card. And of course, Golem Skin, Gauntlets, and other equipment can help you out if you're going to build around this commander. But I think that in general, the heavy restriction on this commander, you know, with that legendary equipment, and also just being, you know, in mono white in a not too powerful and exciting commander, kind of just ruined it for me, and that's why it placed number 9. Next up, let's move on to number 8 with Sheshra Death's Whisper, who definitely had some potential, but most definitely also fell short. Sheshra is a 1-3 human elf warlock that costs 2 black green. She has Bewitching Whispers, when she enters the battlefield, target creature blocks this turn of Fable. And also, Whispers of the Grave, at the beginning of your end step, if a creature died this turn, you may pay 2 life if you do draw a card. Now, this commander could have been incredibly interesting, but the limitations placed on it are just too hefty. First up, being in a Golgari deck, you don't have a lot of ways to use and abuse ETBs, and that ETB isn't all that powerful. If you had access to some blank spells, yeah, that'd be better, but I think overall, if this was just, uh, you know, at the beginning of combat, target creature blocks this turn of Fable, that would be a much better effect, and it would actually make this commander pretty interesting. Being a repeatable automatic effect, you could then build around it and pretty much count on that happening. And there'd be some pretty interesting things that you could do with that, and I'll talk about that here in a second. The other limitation, though, at the beginning of your end step, if a creature died this turn, you may pay two life if you do draw a card, is, again, just too limiting. It doesn't need to be just your end step. It's already limiting it to just one creature, but now it's just limiting it to one creature on every trip around the table instead of just one creature per turn. So, yeah, I think the limitations placed on this commander were just far too much to actually allow it to be an interesting commander. And it's not like that second effect would be all too overpowered. I mean, it's like a much worse death reap ritual at this point. That's an enchantment that says at the beginning of each end step, if a creature died this turn, you may draw a card. Again, that counts every end step, not just your own, and you don't have to pay two life. So even allowing you to just pay the two life still, it wouldn't be overpowered to do it on every person's turn, and it would still be fine. But again, if you want to build around this commander in that forest block because you don't have access to blink spells, you're limited to cards like Teamer Sabretooth and Supernatural Stamina to actually get the creature back in your hand and back in play or back out when it dies. Again, if this is a repeatable effect, though, maybe just, you know, at the beginning of your combat, you can just pick one creature, that would be much more interesting to me. Because you could utilize cards like Broodhatch Nantuko or Ogre Slumlord or Gliss of the Traitor. Broodhatch Nantuko actually wants to be blocked because when it's dealt damage, you create that many 1-1 green insect creature tokens. So essentially, you pick your opponent's biggest creature, and then you send this tiny 1-1 out there to just, you know, die, so you'll eventually draw a card and also get a ton of tokens. And then Ogre Slumlord says, whenever another non-token creature dies, you may create a 1-1 black rat creature token and rat you control of death touch. Basically, you get one rat, and then you just send that an opponent, you force one of their creatures to block that you want to kill, and it's dead, and you get another rat with death touch. Or, you know, Gliss the Traitor, who's just unstoppable in combat with first strike and death touch, so yeah, it's kind of like a target removal spell then with your commander. Again, the concept definitely had potential, but the execution is very lacking in my opinion. With those small tweaks that I talked about, this commander would not have been overpowered, and it would be a lot more interesting, but because of those restrictions, well, it's finishing number 8. But now let's move on to number 7 with yet another commander that I thought had a good amount of potential, it just kind of missed the mark. And yeah, that was an archery joke. Anyways, Canny Bree of Mithril Hall is a 2-2 human archer with first strike and reach that costs green and white. 
Whenever she attacks, you put a plus plus one counter on it for each equipment attached to it. And by paying one, remove all plus plus one counters from Caddy Bree. It deals X damage target attacking or blocking creature and opponent controls where X the number of counters move this way. So first up, yeah, there's a good amount of flavor here, you know, with an archer that, you know, the more equipment against the more arrows that she gets, the more she can dish out damage. What I think really doesn't make sense, though, and what ruins this card, at least for me, is that you have to remove all the plus plus one counters. Okay, first, let's just tackle this flavor-wise. This archer has just been building up arrows and has a ton ready to go. And then some creature comes and attacks and she needs to kill it, and, you know, she just takes every single arrow that she has and shoots them all at once at that creature. Even if it only would have taken four arrows to take that creature down, well, she decided to shoot ten at it all at once for, again, what reason? Why? Why Why not allow it to be a variable amount? You just pick and choose how much you want to remove and you remove that. You're still paying the one. It's not like a walking ballista where you can just do it, you know, without having to pay. So yeah, I thought this was a very interesting concept for a commander, but again, it missed the mark. Now, if you do want to build around this commander, obviously utilize some low to the ground equipment that is cheap to equip, like leather armor, bone saw, and adventuring gear, and yeah, just start equipping and start swinging. You can also utilize an equipment that is free to equip essentially like a Hero's Blade that has whenever a legendary creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may attach Hero's Blade to it. So, yeah, it works with your commander. Obviously, this commander works amazing with Basilisk Collar, giving Death Touch and Life Link. So, yeah, anything that attacks or blocks, you can just essentially kill and gain life with. And in combination with Blade of the Blood Chief, this thing can be incredibly deadly when she has Death Touch. It says whenever a creature dies, put a plus plus one counter on equipped creature. So in that way, yeah, you can basically just ping everything down as long as you've got mana for it. Again, I think this commander had a good amount of potential and was interesting at first, and then unfortunately I got to that remove all part, and then, you know, no, no thank you. So, Kenny Bree of Mithril Hall, well, you finished at number seven. But now it's time for us to move on to number six with Targ Nar Demon Fang Knoll. It's a 2-2 Null for Red Green that has pack tactics whenever it attacks. If you attack with creatures with total power 6 or greater this combat, attacking creatures get plus 1 to 0 until end of turn. And by paying 2 Red Green, you double its power and toughness until end of turn. So your pack tactics payoff with this card is just really uninspiring and not very powerful. I mean, this is kind of like Signal Pest, but a worse version of Battlecry because you need to meet that requirement. Now, obviously, meeting that requirement isn't all that hard, but still, it's really not all that huge of a payoff, especially for a commander. And doubling the power toughness is okay, but that's a decent amount of mana to do so. And not that you're not going to have the mana, but you also need other things to actually make this commander do anything, because, yeah, it could just get chump blocked by a token still. So, overall, it's not that unlike the last commander, it missed the mark, it's just overall uninspiring and very weak. This is one of those commanders where I just think, why did they even make this legendary? This seems like, you know, a just a, a plain uncommon card to me. But if you want to build around this, definitely include Hearthstone, as well as some other pieces of equipment most likely to pump it up with things like Blackblade Reforged and Whisper Soak Cloak to help get it through. And then you're also probably going to want a lot of mana, so yeah, use a ritual effect like Mana Geyser, or kind of like a ritual creature like Clouth Unrivaled Ancient. And of course, if you want to get really wacky with this commander, you can just, you know, I don't know, fling it at someone too. You could do that, sure. But yeah, out of all the commanders from this set, if I had to guess, this one might be toward the very bottom of ones that are actually built around because, yeah, just as I said before, it's it's just not very inspiring and it's really, really, really weak. But Targnar, you have won something, so congratulations, you got number six. Next up, though, let's move on to number five with the Tarask, a 10-10 dinosaur for six green, green, green. The Tarrasque has haste and ward 10 as long as it was cast. And whenever it attacks, it fights target creature defending player controls. Typically, if I'm going to spend 9 mana on a commander, even if I'm in green, I expect a much bigger payoff. I mean, at the very least, why doesn't this have trample? I'm kind of tired of seeing just giant creatures that don't have a way to get through. I mean, yes, okay. It can take out one creature when it fights, and it's going to take out a creature by fighting, and I understand that. But it can still just get chump blocked for days by tokens. It's this massive 10-10 beast of a creature that's hasty as long as you cast it, and it's got Ward 10, which is essentially hexproof, so it defends itself, but it can't get damage through without help. And again, you spent 9 mana on this, and again, that should be some kind of a game-winning commander, and it's just not. I mean, another 9-mana Dinosaur Commander is Zakama Primal Calamity, and this is far from that. 
So yeah, when I first saw the mana cost and the power and toughness, I was very excited with this commander, and then I read it, and then I was very much not. If you want to build around this commander, though, consider a card like Geode Golem that can cheat it out, or cards like Ronus' Monument or Goreclaw that can reduce its cost, help you cast it earlier. Also, consider other giant creatures that care about power like Galta Primal Hunger, which would eat this dinosaur for breakfast, and then Faux Razor Region and Loxton and Warhammer as well. Faux Razor can benefit you whenever you fight, and obviously Loxton and Warhammer can give lifelink and trample in plus 3 plus 0, so there's your way to get your damage through. But again, for a mythic giant dinosaur for 9 mana, I expect a bigger payoff. So because of that, the Tarrasque, you have finished at number 5. Next up, though, let's move on to number 4 with Kalein, Reclusive Painter. Kalein is a 1-2 human elf bard that costs black red. She has, when she enters the battlefield, create a treasure token, and other creatures you control enter the battlefield with an additional plus plus one counter on them for each mana from a treasure spent to cast them. So, like previous commanders that I've mentioned, I think this commander was close to being really interesting, but it fell short. In my opinion, one of two things need to change to make this commander more interesting. The first could have been, instead of just, just being an ETB for a treasure token, give me treasure for other things as well. This needs to be a treasure token generator in some way. Maybe that's when I perform a certain action. Maybe it's when a creature hits my graveyard. Maybe it's when a creature leaves my graveyard. I'm not sure. It needs to be something else that can actually generate me tokens, though. But if giving me more treasure isn't a possibility, give me a bigger payoff. Maybe instead it's something like, whenever you cast a creature spell, if you use mana from a treasure to cast it, it deals damage equal to its power to any target, or something like that. At this point, I either need a bigger payoff or more ways to make treasure to make this commander interesting, at least to me. Now, that being said, recently we are getting more and more ways to actually make treasure with things like Tempting Contract and Gadric Crown Scourge, and of course, Revel and Riches is one of the original ways to make a lot of treasure. And also, there's Pitiless Plunder and Grim Hireling, and even Fane the Broker could help out as well. But again, just overall, utilizing a lot of treasure for not all that great of a payoff is kind of just uninteresting to me. Again, I think this commander was close to being interesting, and that's what hurt. So because of that, Kalein Reclusive Painter, you have finished at number 4. And speaking of that, next up is Varus Silvery Moon Ranger, and I had to look at that name like 5 times because Silvery Moon is, yeah, that, that's the word. Regardless, it's a 3-3 Human Elf Ranger with Reach and Ward 1 that costs 1 green green. It has whenever you cast a creature or a Planeswalker spell, venture into the dungeon, this ability triggers only once each turn. We'll get back to that here in a second. Anyways, whenever you complete a dungeon, create a 2-2 Green Wolf Creature token. Those 7 words, this ability triggers only once each turn, absolutely killed this card for me. I feel like that was very much not needed. I mean, this is on a creature or Planeswalker cast, not even on an ETB. So because of that, this commander's potential basically completely went all the way down the drain. Now at least this can trigger on your opponent's turn, so yeah, flash creatures like Ambush Viper or Spear of the Hunt and Night Pack Ambusher, which are actually wolves, can help you out too. Or you know, you can just give all your green creatures flash with Yavi Nature's Herald, and you can give all your wolves death touch and make them more impactful with Ren's Run Pack Master. But you do have the Champion Elf, so keep that in mind. And then, of course, to cast this creature, you need some cost reduction with something like Dustwatch Recruiter. Or should I say, Kralin Horde Howler, because when it flips, yeah, it gives you that cost reduction for creatures. Regardless, yeah, if you want to make this commander effective, you're going to have to build a pretty narrow deck to do so. And the payoff really isn't impactful enough to be worth all those steps around that you're having to go through to actually make it work. At least, in my opinion, it's not. Again, that restriction of this ability triggers only once each term seems... Well, like it didn't really need to be there, this commander would not be overpowered in any way if that wasn't there. So because of that, that limitation to me didn't make this commander interesting, it actually made it uninteresting. So Varus, because of those seven words, I've got seven new words for you. You have finished at number three. Dude. Okay, I needed one more word on the end, but I got there, okay? But now let's move on to number 2 with Farida, Devil's Chosen. Farida is a 3-3 Tiefling Warlock that costs 2 blue red. She has Dark One's own luck. Whenever you roll one or more dice, Farida, Devil's Chosen gains flying and menace until end of turn. If any of those results was 10 or higher, draw a card. Okay, so the payoff of flying and menace, eh, not all that great. The drawing a card is nice, though, if you roll a 10 or higher, so cool. The problem is, is that outside of this set, there aren't any cards that have you roll dice. 
Now that might change in the future, but at this point, you're extremely limited with what cards you can actually put in this deck because you need to put a lot of roll dice cards in or it's not going to work. So since you're going to have to run a lot of less than desirable cards to try to make this commander even work. Now when a new and exciting thing comes out and I see a commander that works with that, I really like to see that commander actually support the mechanic itself. So this commander might benefit us from rolling dice, but it doesn't give us a way to actually roll dice. And again, there really aren't that many cards that do that. If rolling dice was more of a supported mechanic in Magic, sure, but at this point, it's not. So because of that, again, this is extremely narrow in what you can actually do with this commander. And then again, the payoff is just, well, okay. You basically have a 50-50 shot of drawing a card. And yeah, I'm ignoring the Flying and Menace for now, okay? Regardless, basically every single deck built around this commander has to run the exact same cards like Component Pouch, Wizard Spellbook, and Netherese Puzzle Ward. Not a whole lot of innovation out there when you need repeatable roll dice effects. And of course, they're also going to be running other cards like Maddening Hex, Ebony Fly, and Pixie Guide, which is kind of like a Krark's thumb, but instead of flipping coins, it's rolling dice. So yeah, in a roll dice deck, that could help out. Keep in mind, though, that unfortunately, Farida does say one or more dice, so this isn't a double trigger off of it, but you can choose the higher result to potentially draw a card. So again, I like the concept of rolling dice, and yes, this is a commander that can benefit you when you do roll dice, but... This commander does not give you a way to roll dice. And because of that, Farida, you're number two. But now it's time for us to move on to number one and the golden toilet of Dungeons and Dragons, Adventures in the Forgotten Realms, and the pre-cons goes to Hama Pashar Ruin Seeker. Hama Pashar is a 2-3 human wizard that costs one white blue, and it says room abilities of dungeons you own trigger initial time. The exact same problem that I had with that last commander, I have with this one. I like the venture into the dungeon mechanic, and I like commanders that do that, at least ones that do it effectively. And this commander gives you additional benefits when you do venture into the dungeon. Only problem is that you've got like exactly 20 cards that can help you. Again, when a new mechanic comes out and there is a commander for that mechanic, I like a commander that can support that mechanic. This commander gives me a way to benefit from venturing to the dungeon, but it gives me absolutely no way to actually venture into the dungeon. And outside of those 20 cards or so that actually help me do that in Azorius, I don't have any other way to do that. And many of those cards are pretty bad. So trying to use a very restricted amount of cards, some of them being very bad to build the bases of a deck around, is not going to work out too well for you. Doubling up dungeon triggers is a very cool concept, but again, this one just falls flat on its face before it even gets out the door. I mean, at least meet me halfway and give me access to all colors if you're not going to give me a way to venture into the dungeon. And in that case, I at least have access to like almost 40 cards or so, okay? It's not perfect, but it's better than this. But again, instead of actually giving me access to that, maybe just give me some kind of a Hey, whenever your creatures deal combat damage to a player, you know, you get to venture in the dungeon or something like that. That way I can focus on, you know, creatures that I can get combat damage in with, and then I can venture in the dungeon and I can double up those room ability triggers. But with this, there's essentially no focus outside of, okay, try to go find those 20 cards and hope that this deck can work. So because of the potential that you had and how badly you missed the mark, even more so than the Archer, Hama Bashar, Ruin Seeker, you are the golden toilet of Dungeons and Dragons, Adventures in the Forgotten Realms and the Precons and whatnot. Make sure you check your mailbox for the Golden Toilet Award, which will be shipped to you very shortly. Again, a big thank you to all the commanders that competed for this infamous award. And if you haven't seen my most recent episode on the Golden Pig of Dungeons and Dragons, Adventures in the Forgotten Realms and the Precons, make sure you check that one out. It's essentially the exact opposite of the Golden Toilet Award. On that episode, I go through my picks for the best commanders from the set and the pre-cons, and one is awarded with the title of the Golden Pig. And again, best doesn't mean most powerful, just like Golden Toilet does not mean weakest. But anyways, I hope that you enjoyed the Golden Toilet Awards, and as always, thanks again, and have a good one.